And if you want the window down, Jamie, you pull the window down. Steady on, steady on, baby. That's the Churchill tank. That's the Churchill tank. Yeah. Yeah. Ooh, to write. It is Pegasus Bridge. Wow. We've been on the like one that is a replica. That's the second bridge. The original. This is what she said. Okay, she Oh, that's not the end of that. That's a German one.
There's one of them near Newcastle. Yeah, and it's the oldest British steam powered bridge. And it goes all the way this way. Mm -hmm. Original Pegasus sign. This is where the museum has been built. Just after midnight on D Day, the Glider Regiment, signed in Normandy by Richard Gale, needed to capture the bridge over the canal, the bridge over the old river. Major John Howard, right here on the wall, was on board the first glider that landed in Normandy. So we sell gliders in Normandy, you know, <coughs> later on if you want, we can go together in the park. Uh, we do have a whole stack glider, a full-size glider, completely rebuilt. I mean, when you see the size of the glider, I mean, we're talking about large gliders, you know, each one of them could actually transport 28 men and two pilots, 30 men altogether. So to capture the bridge, General Gelsen in Normandy, 180 soldiers on both six gliders. Just after midnight, between Merville and Cabourg, the first gliders were in, on approach. Now the first one, the first glider that landed in Normandy was piloted by James Wellwalk. Now you're going to see James Wellwalk in a few minutes, and this little film. Uh, keep in mind, you know, James Wellwalk was recognized as one of the best pilots on D-Day. Just after midnight, James Wellwalk was able to fly 12 kilometers, made a full turn, he landed precisely 45 yards away from the bridge at 12.16 a.m. 45 yards away from the bridge, which is absolutely amazing, mm -hmm. considering the fact that there was absolutely no light on the ground. Uh, all they had in the cockpit was a stopwatch, a map, and an altimeter, that was it. But he managed to land 45 yards away from the bridge. You know, if you leave the museum today, you can see the landing zone. It's just across the road here. We're talking about a small patch of land, actually. But this was for the first glider. Glider number two did exactly the same trajectory and landed 75 yards away from the bridge at 12.17 a.m., one minute later. Finally, the third glider crash-landed at 12.18 a.m. between glider number one and two. I mean, this pilot managed to land in the between of the two first gliders. Of course, it was a crash-landing. And unfortunately, a young man was killed. This young man's name was Greenalf. He was 22 years old. And fortunately, he drowned in the pond that still exists today. But in three minutes, three British gliders landed in Normandy. Major John Howard and his men ran out of the gliders. At 12.30, the bridge was secured. 
It took only 10 minutes for the six British Airborne Division to capture the bridge. Now, the hardest part was to hold on to the bridge. Remember, the day arrived just after midnight, but the British and French commando that landed on Seoul Beach did not arrive until 8.30 a.m. It took quite a bit of time for those commandos to cross the countryside and to arrive at Benouville. So clearly, between midnight and midday, it became very difficult for Major John Howard to hold on to the bridge. But if you want to come with me again after the film, you can go on the bridge, and I will tell you how they managed to hold on to this bridge. Let's talk about the bridge over the Orne River. The Orne River is only 450 meters out of the museum on my left. Again, three gliders with sand and Normandy, 90 men. Uh, but if you look at the landing zone, you can tell that there is only two of them there. Can you see that? Mm. Indeed, glider number five and glider number six landed close to the bridge. And of course, the 60 men on board got that glider captured the bridge very quickly. However, for glider number four, it became a nightmare. You know, when the glider were tugged in Normandy, they were tugged by bombers. As you can see, you have a glider here, mm -hmm. and you have a bomber just there. The pilot inside the bomber made a mistake. Instead of looking at the own river, he looked at the deep river, which is right there. Look where it's at. This is glider number four. Now, there is a big problem for the men on board glider number four. First of all, remember the objective. The objective to, was to secure the eastern flank. <coughs> to permit the men to land on Salt Beach. Clearly, the 30 men on board glider number four are just behind enemy line. That's a problem. They landed in the middle of the marsh. Can you see the marsh there? Now, this was voluntarily installed by the Germans in 1943. You know, in 1943, Marshal Rommel came in Normandy. Among all the obstacles that were displayed on the coast, he gave orders. The orders were to flood Normandy, mm -hmm. just to avoid the landings, and of course for the paratroopers to be dropped. The 30 men on board these gliders are behind an army line in the middle of the map and completely isolated from the rest of the troops. Even though two of the men were killed, two of them, the 28 men on board managed to get out of the marsh, cross the enemy line, and they regrouped here by the end of D Day, by the end of June 7, excuse me, 24 hours later. So, as you can see, the first mission was to capture both bridges. The bridges were captured very quickly. The bridge over the Canal of Caen was renamed Pegasus Bridge, June 6, 1944. Do you know why? Do you have any idea why? No? Have you look at the emblem of the Sixth British Airborne? Pegasus, the flying horse. Okay, so this museum, this uh, bridge was just renamed Pegasus Bridge after the Sixth British Airborne. Okay. Now, during the night before Overlord Operation on D Day, there was another mission, very important one. The second mission was to neutralize Merville Battery. Can you see Merville right there? Mm -hmm. It's not far from here. It's only a 15 minute drive away from here. Merville had to be neutralized because Merville could compromise not only the landing on Salt Beach, but Merville would probably be able to destroy both bridges. So, General Gill did not send the glider regiment, not the oxen box, but different battalion of paratroopers, with Colonel Otway. Their job was to neutralize Merville Battery. 650 paratroopers were dropped in them in this area. However, because of the strong winds, many of them were spread all over the place. Colonel Otway managed to regroup 150 men to neutralize Merville Battery. Merville Battery was finally neutralized before sunrise with 150 paratroopers. And fortunately, it was neutralized just for a few hours. It was taken again by the Germans during that day. It became very difficult for Colonel Otway and his men. And keep in mind, during that night, 450 paratroopers were killed. Most of them are today resting at Randale Cemetery. Among them, among them, there is a very young paratrooper by the name of Robert Jones. How old are you, young man? Uh, 19. 19. Robert Jones was 16 years old. You know, after after D Day, after the the, the Normandy campaign, uh, we looked at all soldiers that were actually sacrificed in Normandy, and you know, um, General Gale realized 
that among all the soldiers that were part of the Sixth British Air Bomb Division, many of them actually cheated on their, their age. You know, they, they were tall, young, yeah, and they just cheated, you know, on their identity just to get involved. So basically, they, they did sacrifice their lives, you know. So this was the second mission, and the third one was to hold the Germans back on the eastern flank. The paratroopers during the night had to destroy the bridge over the Dee River on the eastern flank. Of course, we knew we could stop the Panzer divisions that were in the area. However, we knew that if we blew up all the bridges on the eastern flank, we could slow them down, which would give enough time for the commandos to land on Seoul Beach. History was in the making, June 6, 1944. It was a Tuesday when the commandos, British and French commandos, landed on Seoul Beach. Of course, first they had to secure the coast and then walk to the countryside. It clearly took nearly six hours for the commandos to arrive at Benoville. Operation Deadstick was on the way. There was a reinforcement of this area for Major Howard and his men. During that very same day, as you can tell and see on this map, many gliders landed. You know, for instance, there were 352 of those horse gliders that landed here. But not only other gliders landed in Normandy, like this one, the Halifax glider, which you see. Mm -hmm. and the particularity of the Halifax glider is the Halifax, excuse me. Amilcar glider. Halifax are bombers. Amilcar gliders. <laughs> The Amilcar gliders uh, have a particularity is that you can load tanks on board, mm -hmm. but it's still a glider, you know. And uh, after the film, if you want, I will show you the full-size horse glider. And the horse glider was a troop transporter, but we also transport military equipment on board, like jeeps, trailers, and cannons. Mm -hmm. The hardest part, of course, was to load them in. You know, it was actually very difficult. Um, do you have any questions about the mission so far? No? Is it clear enough for you? Yes? Yeah. Okay, so what we're going to do, uh, we're going to sit down if you want. D-Day was an operation without precedent in military history. A vast piece of tactical planning and logistic support that involved the movement of thousands of men and their supplies across nearly 100 miles of water on a scale hitherto undreamed of in any amphibious operation. Like many great enterprises, it was made up of numerous smaller independent plans. One of these was the assault by the British 6th Airborne Division. It was an assault ordered directly by Field Marshal Montgomery and it failed to General Richard Gale and his officers and men to plan and execute it. General Richard's mission was to secure the east or left flank of the Allied landings. This left flank had to be seized before the main seaboard assault and then consolidated and defended. It would eventually form the hinge on which the entire Allied force would pivot as it broke out of the beachhead to sweep on to Paris, Brussels, Antwerp, the Rhine, and eventually into Germany. What the 6th Airborne Division achieved in those early hours and days of the invasion must never be forgotten. And it is to them, and particularly to those who fell in that great enterprise, that the Pegasus Memorial and this short film are dedicated. The image is always very powerful. It always brings us back to the price for our freedom. June 2000, the 6th Airborne escorts the inauguration of the Pegasus Memorial under the orders of Prince Charles. <laughs> de retour en Normandie et en ma qualité de colonel en chef du parachute regiment, un joie particulier que de m'y retrouver sur le lieu même euh, d'un des hauts faits de la 6e division aéroportée. 
The future king attended the ceremonies for the 60th anniversary for D-Day 2004. This time at the Ranville Museum, it's a replica of a horse glider which contributes towards the debt of gratitude normally owes to the heroes from Great Britain and Canada. The day before D-Day, here is the distinctive armada of horse gliders and the commander of the 6th Airborne Division, Major General Gale. He planned the night crossing which would lead to a settling of scores. Firstly will be the events of the capture of two bridges, intact, but also a story of bridges to destroy. There are five of them on the River Deep. After that, the German battery at Merville will have to be neutralized. Everything has to be prepared to the utmost detail. The first meeting will be just after midnight in Bellevue and at Randville. The coup de main operation was rehearsed with blank ammunition, props and extras, which were essential as most men had never had prior experience with weaponry. Good reason to leave after a good, maybe last cup of tea. Each unit boarded with war correspondents. The BBC broadcasted a hastily produced programme covering this night from 5th to the 6th of June 1944. This is Chester Wilmot, broadcasting from a glider, bound for France and invasion. The men who are sitting on the benches in the back of the glider are not wondering whether the parachutists have succeeded in seizing the ground on which we're going to land. But if they're worried about it, they give no sign to it. But a little while ago, when I moved back down the glider, I found the battle at the end worth thinking. Meanwhile, the perfectly timed arrival at the Benneville Bridge is the result of many hours of training. I could see the target, the moon was on it, I could see the bridge, I could see the whites of their eyes almost, and I knew bloody well we were going to make it, and thank God we did. I was delighted. There was no firing. We had complete surprise. And that moment I will never, never forget. And I relive it every time I go back to France now for the anniversaries of our landings. The first pictures of the captured bridges are breathtaking. The gliders landed exactly on target. The coup de main operation cost one life and two wounded. From now on, this bridge will always be known as Pegasus Bridge. However, for the parachutists, the mission was a much more delicate affair. Everything was rehearsed on British soil. However, the night became a nightmare. Men are scattered by strong winds and from the flak of anti-aircraft defence batteries. In order to capture the Merville battery, the men of the 9th Battalion numbered just 150 of the planned 650. Only half of those present would remain standing after a bloody hand-to-hand -hand fight, but they never wavered. No, never. I'm a parachutist and I'm Irish. We never retreat. Early that morning, 177 Frenchmen led by Philippe Kiefer accompanied the landing of Lord Lovett's commandos on Sword Beach. They'll hear later of the heavy sacrifice of 9th Battalion, who prepared the way for them through Benoville. It is at this moment that fiction merged with reality during the shooting of the cult film, The Longest Day. This is where, about 15 years later, Lord Lovett plays his own role. Where Major Howard, made a briefing to his stand-in, Richard Todd, a veteran himself. Where Lord 
Lovett apologizes once again to Major Howard for the slight delay in making the meeting point. And where finally, this same Lord Lovett victoriously accompanies his faithful piper, Bill Millen, crossing Pegasus Bridge. Victory. General Eisenhower, Supreme Allied Commander, thought pensively about it that morning from his headquarters in southern England. Not all the objectives were achieved, but the effect of surprise had proved vital. These are the pictures of the Orn estuary that are shown in German cinemas. The commentator explains that the Allied attempt at landing has just been thrown back into the sea. On the spot, things are very different. For example, the 21st Panzer Division operation on the area. This German armoured division will be waiting for hours for an order to counterattack. You all the streets, villages, archers, and so on, so we could start a night attack. And uh, this honor wasn't known to us. So we stood all the time until the, the afternoon of the city. And as the Allies moved forward on D-Day, Adolf Hitler slept. Despite the critical situation, no one dares wake him. The 6th Airborne will still have to hold the bridgehead and get prepared to confront the inevitable counterattack from the enemy. Escoville, Omfreville, the coast of Breville, these small, quiet Norman villages will become both pivotal and sanctuaries during the engagements of the 6th Airborne Division. At the end of the afternoon of June 6th, more than 100 gliders will be towed and released above the Orne estuary. Seen from the sky, these are the craters left by the Allied bombardments of that day. On the ground, the fleet of gliders helps us understand why the 6th Airborne alone lost 4,000 killed, wounded, or missing in action. definitively controls the entire east sector of the Orne River, a whole sector in ruins, like much of Normandy. Despite his age at 48, General Gay was already a veteran of World War I, of the Battle of the Somme. This is the second time he helped France push the Germans back from her land. If the civilian population paid a heavy price for the liberation, they have been forever grateful and they express it with great simplicity to General Montgomery, the Commander-in-Chief of the British. But there remain many battles ahead for the 6th Airborne Division. The end of the Normandy campaign, with the offensive to the Seine River in August, the bloody battle in the Ardennes, and the crossing of the Rhine. Hardly time to fraternize with the Norman people. The 6th Airborne Division will be rested in September 1944. But before leaving, a few soldiers will again become farmers, just for harvest time, on the few fields left intact after the violent deluge of war. The picture of true freedom. The war is over, thank God. We haven't had another one. And please God, we don't have another. Our fallen comrades,
some sort of you sign black and white. Mm. There you are. <laughs> Welcome to Pegasus Bridge. This is the original bridge that was captured by Major Howard and his men during the night of June 5th and 6th. Now, of course, the bridge was not always here. The bridge used to be on the canal, but there is no one there. And I must say, it's very confusing. Actually, they just don't know. Is this a replica? Is this one a replica? Actually, both bridge or real bridge? just about to be built on Salt Beach. So of course the big ship are using the canal in the winter and they're going all the way to Caen, which is 20 kilometers south of here. So we widened the canal, so we added a piece to the bridge, which modified the bridge. And of course, since it's a balanced bridge, it became a big problem. You know, you know what you have here are the counterweights. You see the big square box? Those are the counterweights. The counterweights weighs 300 tons is enormous. The flat, 200 tons. And just on the front, if you want to come here, just on the front of the bread, you can still see it. You got a cabin. Can you see the cabin? With the windows? Well, inside you have electrical and diesel engines. So of course there were two operators pushing on the switch and then the bridge could actually reach balance out. But of course, when it was modified in the problems, the engine were not powerful enough, so the bridge was breaking down all the time. Finally, in 1993, it was replaced by the new one. The problem was is that in 1993, the museum was not built. So nobody knew what to do with the bridge. As a matter of fact, at first, it was supposed to go to scrap metal. I don't know if you realize that bad people bridge that was liberated in France. Nobody wanted a bridge to be scrap metal. So finally, to calm everybody down, the French states decided to and it stayed there for seven years. And finally, in 2000, we, the association in which we are part of, decided to buy the bridge back to the French state, so we did. And we paid that price. Believe it or not, we did pay. We just wanted to make sure it was legal yeah. and the bridge was ours. So we bought it back and let me tell you this, this was a poison gift. It cost nearly a quarter million euros to bring it back here. You know, the, the bridge is the original Pegasus Bridge. You can see the impact. There is impact you know, all over the place, you can see that, yeah, right there. If you look at the counterweight, you will see there is bullet holes, shell holes. You know, so this is part of the Unfortunately, he was selling 
whatever he could, you know, because that was the end of the war and he, he lost quite a few thousand, hundreds of thousands of soldiers. So he was sending young teenagers and young men. And on the bridge at night, there were two young teenagers, barely 18 years old. One of them was killed. And the other one, keep in mind, is still alive today. He's still alive today. His name is Helmut Romer. Helmut Romer came back in Normandy a few years back. And of course, when he came back to Normandy, it was the first time he was coming back. So we wanted to know his side of the story. You know, usually when you read a book, <laughs> the winners wrote the book, not the losers, you know? Mm. So we wanted to know exactly how he remembered things. And we asked him, did you see the gliders coming in? And he said, no, I didn't. And we asked him, did you see the gliders coming in? Did you hear the gliders coming in? Did you hear them landing in? And we asked him that question, he hesitated to give us an answer. And of course he hesitated because he looked at us and said, you know what, I do remember that night. It was a complete chaos. There were the bombers dropping bombs all over Normandy. There was Germans' battery trying to reach the bombers. They were dropping bombs on the ground. Mm. Aircraft falling off the sky. It was a complete chaos for him. So he told us, he said, look, maybe I heard the gliders, maybe not. I don't know. I mean, remember I told you, you know, James Wellwalk landed 45 yards away from the bridge, which is, by the way, the distance between the bridge and the front of the the tall pine tree here. You yes. see the flags over there? Yes. This is the landing zone. And the bridge here used to be where the new one is. Look yeah. at the proximity. Can you see that? Very close. Extremely close. Okay. Extremely close. So, which is one of the most spectacular missions of all. So the bridge was captured because there was only two Germans on the bridge. In that village there were 50 of them. But nobody wanted to move because nobody got orders. Remember Hitler? Hitler gave orders not to be awake before 9 a.m. Yeah. Guess what? Nobody dared to wake him up. And how we have. So he was asleep. The German, the high rank officer, Germans, uh, did not give any orders either. They waited. But it was too late. By 9 a.m., everybody was in hand. So Major Howard had to deal with that. Now, there was a German counter-attack early in the morning on June 6, 1944. And during that German counter-attack, a young lieutenant was killed on this bridge. His name was Dan Brotheridge, and today is buried at Randale Cemetery in the civilian cemetery. Because on the we did not have any military cemetery yet. Is it okay? Yeah. Do you have any questions? Let's go to the library. This is a shell that almost destroyed the bridge. Now, if you look on the stairwell, there is one of has completely been rebuilt, was the exact design of gliders that landed in there in the end of the 1940s. You know, the only piece of a fuselage that we have today worldwide is there. This is an original piece of a fuselage that you see here. Now the whole side glider, believe it or not, was built with plywood. And the thickness is only 3 millimeters. I don't know if you realize, No, 
but I mean, it took a lot of guts to get on, on something like this. Oh, of course, the lighter transport of soldiers, not only soldiers, we also transport military equipment. You know, if you go back into the museum, you'll notice there is a jeep in this museum. This jeep landed in Normandy on board a glider. Now, the hardest part was to load it in. Very hard to load a jeep on board something like this. Look at the fuselage. You can see there is a very large piece of a fuselage that becomes a door. You know, so just imagine soldiers pushing the jeep on board. Everything was fine, right? Except that they couldn't get the jeep to turn in. The jeep was much too big. And of course, the glider was much too narrow. And of course, they couldn't take the chance of pushing the jeep, forcing the jeep in because the fuselage is only three meters thick. Mm. So General Giel never gave up the idea of loading the jeeps on board the gliders. He gave orders to take the jeeps apart. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, that seemed pretty amazing. Of course, they did not remove, they didn't take the engine apart, but they removed so many things on the jeeps. You know, the bumpers were removed, mm. the footsteps, all the tools around the jeep were taken out. Like the shovels, for instance, yeah. the hooks, the jerry cans, everything was removed on the jeep. Then, to get the jeep underneath the wings, they removed the steering wheels. They tilted down a windshield and they flat down the wheel. Oh, that took 45 minutes, but once it was done, the jeep was in. There you go. Except that the General Gale realized there was a problem. It took way too much time to do this. In England, he knew once the glider would be landing in them, most of the time they would be landing in flooded area. That is why you can see this which happened to be very dangerous. Imagine. Just imagine for a second, those gliders landed at 120 kilometers per hour. It is plywood. But when the skid, when the tip of the skid would grab on dirt, they would flip over. And then you would have soldiers, whether killed or injured. So basically, they could not get in combat. So those gliders landed in the middle of flooded area, the marsh. They landed in the middle of the field, the countryside, on the back road as well. And unfortunately, they landed on the German fire. So basically, the 45 minutes it took to load the jeeps in Great Britain, mm -hmm. General Gale realized they would not have that much time once they would be in Normandy. The decision was made. The Horsa glider would become disposable gliders. What I'm saying by this, is that once they landed in Normandy, they would be destroyed. Look at the pictures in the museum. Most of the gliders are cut in half. Mm. The only way they could exit all the vehicles, like the trailer, jeeps, and cannons, was by destroying the gliders from the tail end. And the guy made everything as quickly as possible for the paratroopers to move on. You know, on D Day alone, there were 352 of those gliders that landed in Normandy just around you. 50 kilometers around you, 352, that's enormous. Mm. Only 39 of those gliders went back to England. Everything else stayed right here. Now, of course, during the winter of 1944 and 1945, as you can imagine, the local population did not have anything left. It was very cold. So the local population was using the wood to keep warm. The wheels were being used by local farmers the bomb craters up. They kept them for years, you know, these old wheels were kept by a local farmer for 60 years. Those are wooden wheels. Okay. But keep in mind, today, and when I say today, no farther than last September, people are still finding pieces of gliders all over the place. Last September, somebody brought us the inside of the wings, which is metal here at this museum say, hey, I found this in my, uh, <laughs> in my countryside. We do find stuff all the time. As a matter of fact, we do find bombs still to this day, you know. Last uh, winter, Wisriam, which is eight, 11 kilometers north of here, was literally shut down. The 
actually found in the 500 pound bomb from World War II. 500 pounds. I don't know if you realize how big this is. So they have to evacuate everybody along. So this is what I wanted to tell you about the six British and Canadian air bomb. Keep in mind, in 1944, there were 12,000 of them. 4,000 of those soldiers were whether killed, wounded, or missing in action. This uh, division today has 16 of the veterans left. And the next June, on the 5th, they will all be here with their families. 16 of them left. I thank you. I hope it was okay for you. I apologize if it was not perfect, but I sure hope you understood what I tried to transmit to you. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of your visit at Pegasus Memorial. If you have any questions, I stay with you. Questions? Clear enough for you? Yes. Yep. All right. Thank you.
Christ for the liberation, they have been forever grateful. And they express it in many battles ahead of the sixth day of the division. The end of the Normandy campaign will be affected to the same group in August, the bloody battle in the Ardennes, and the crossing of the Rhine. Hardly time to fraternize with the Norman people.
I think he's I think got to wait for you. I'm not sure. Little lorry. Thank you, monsieur. Mm. Hope you're a bum. I don't know if there's some little red lorry. Yeah, that's not far. Why did they extend? Right, I didn't record a start at off day five but today is day five at the end of it i'm watching the a team in french but our journey is coming to an end soon and i found out the reason why we couldn't actually go to paris uh, and see the call of duty spot there were riot protest where it was so sorry guys i tried my best we were 1.5 kilometers away, so in miles for the UK viewers, that's probably about 1.2 miles, estimate, but there you are, we, we tried, and we're going to try next time, but tomorrow, I don't know what we're doing, we're heading back to Dunkirk, I know that, and then we then the next day we're back on back going home so i might do some video in there i am going to record going through the channel tunnel from the front to the car not the back this time because my brother wanted to record on the way there but enjoy what happens tomorrow even if it's just me traveling i take a video i don't know what we're going to be doing but we're traveling back to Dunkirk and then we're gonna go over to the channel tunnel the next day back home and then then I will be recording a day in a life hopefully uh, I haven't yet thought about it I might do a week in a life and um, at the minute I'm in CN so we've got got to go from CN to Dunkirk tomorrow so we don't know I am going to see what we're going to be doing later on whether we're going to drop off to a museum whether we're going to go to Arras uh, or whether we're going to be going to a trench World War One trench I don't know so see you tomorrow for day six see you day six and then for day seven. See you then.
te imponieron. Y ya, ya. Dunkirk Beach. Home. This is one of the platforms that can only load one end lot. Number 16, AJ. 9816.
take forever. Wait till the next one.
So, hi guys, that is it for this video. I hope you guys enjoyed, and I will see you in the next video. Peace.